Lecture Luncheon Lecture. As you know, uh, this is a series that meets every Monday during the semester, fall and spring semesters at Penn State here and uh, sponsored by the Department of Comparative Literature with the collaboration of the Center for Global Studies. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to mention a couple, make a couple of announcements, mention a couple of events that are happening this week. Um, first, I want to pass around the poster for um, an event that's happening next Tuesday, the 29th, which is an evening with the filmmaker Mo Azuman. It's a showing of the Aryans, but also a meeting with the filmmaker. Uh, it's a really fascinating documentary, which I'll pass around. Secondly, with a larger poster, uh, the Penn State Reading Marathon, Marathon Reading, takes place beginning on noon on the 24th, Thursday the 24th, and extends till one o'clock the next day. So it's an overnight sensation um, of a different kind than the usual overnight sensations. Um, and this, this year's topic is a uh, marathon of madness. So please come and join um, the public and the students and the faculty of Penn State. That event, and I'll just mention thirdly and finally that next week's speaker in the Comparative Literature Luncheon Lecture Series is Leslie Harkema from Yale University, will be speaking on Spanish modernist poetics. The title of her talk is Saplings and Crustaceans, Figuring Youth and Age in Spanish Modernist Poetics. That should be a good talk. Um, but now to the, the present day here. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Andrew Singer, um, who is now one of our community here at Penn State. Uh, Andrew is a literary translator and editor, a literary host and events organizer, um, soon to be a radio personality, let's say, um, and a practicing writer. He has taught graduate seminars and workshops on literary translation and on literature in Europe. And he joins us this year as an instructor in literary translation in the comparative literature department here at Penn State. Andrew is the director, does that, that apply to us? No, it's just a, it's a hoax device. Though. Exactly. <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was a fire alarm. Uh, Andrew is the director of Traffica Europe, a literary journal that showcases new European literature in English translation, representing work from across the 47 countries of the Council of Europe. Traffica Europe introduces new voices, um, fosters collaboration, and aims to create a kind of community of communities through the circulation of contemporary writing. With its online literary quarterly and with its new project, Traffica Radio, Traffica Europe Radio, Europe's literary radio station. Traffica aims to help renew the role of literature in nudging along the European conversation and culture. It's a great honor to have Andrew Singer here at Penn State and to be part of our literature community um, in turn to become part of that conversation as well. His talk today is on uh, gypsy literature, it's called Romani Literature in Europe. Scope for a wider narrative. So please join me in welcoming Andrew Singer. Songster siblings, bird faded brothers, I hail you with blossoming tongue, with words that weathered the camp of drought. Contemplation is pushing out small leaves veined with sorrow into the light. A grave digger silence sought my skull in its hands. The sign of my absence adorned each news. He's dead, burnt out, they claimed. Eyebrows arching into the dust of death are hassled by tweezers of worms. Gardens sought my tomb with lily scepters in hand. A fox-skinned dawn creeping up behind them ignited the pentacle sparks of his fingers. Eavesdropped, lay low amidst red reeds of rays. And when they looked back, wind blew into the grief-absorbed domain, wind furnishing the heart's chamber with the ashes of my glow, with their backs to the supposed tragedy, rustling men stroking peacocks of mirage. He, recruited by the storm-speaking sea to be a pebble <laughs> under the tongue, comes now to life and checks his fate. That's the beginning of a poem called Exile, 
by a Hungarian Roma poet, uh, Bari Károly, in English, Károly Bari, Charles Bari. Uh, he is about 62 years old, he's still living in Hungary. And uh, he got a fascinating start to his career, which is a good point to start this uh, discussion. So I want to tell you today a little bit about Romani literature in Europe. Uh, uh, I'll talk about a little bit about some of the major characters. We have very little time to cover such a vast topic, so it'll just be the barest outline, really. Um, but then I want to talk a little bit about a little bit of the history of Romani literature, how it's developed, why we don't know anything about it, uh, and I'm generalizing here, <laughs> but many people don't, um, and how it might be developing nowadays and what we can do about it, and put that in the context of a project that I'm working on, Traffica Europe, and hopefully tell you a little bit about that. Um, I don't know how long the actual formal talk part will go, um, but we have a question and answer period which segues smoothly after that, and I hope we can continue the conversation about any of those things that you find of value uh, after, I, after I outline some of these. Um, Bari Karoy, or Karoy Bari, uh, is a, a, a good figure to start with because he was... 17 years old when he published his first book of Roma poetry in Hungary. And it coincided with a time on, uh, in under uh, uh, state socialism when the Hungarian government was suddenly keen on doing an about face and recognizing that the Romani language actually existed. Um, and around 1964, the uh, Hungarians, the, the government under Soviet uh, socialism, officially declared that there was no such thing as Roma literature and language, <laughs> no such thing as Roma culture, no such thing as Romani ethnic groupings, um, and so uh, in effect uh, didn't recognize uh, their existence. And around 1972 they decided um, it would be, it would serve the state to uh, suddenly recognize them. And here was this bright young poet, uh, Karoy Bari, so they decided to film a po translate a poem of his and film him reading it in Romani language on Hungarian state television. And back then television was live. And they, uh, he was going to read it in Romani and they translated it. Uh, and in, in one of his lines, he talks about the poor of Hungary, dealing with the poor in the countryside. And they said, y you mean the Roma, right? So they were, had gotten far enough to acknowledge that there were Roma, that they actually existed, but the fact that there was some general notion of poor people in Hungary was still outside the pale. Um, so they censored him. They said, you, you know, you have to say the Roma in Hungary. That was now the party line. But it was live television. So when it came time to actually reading the poem, he read it his way. And uh, effectively, uh, that symbolically began the Roma human rights uh, movement in Hungary. And so Roma civil rights and Roma literature are very much tied together in this generation. Uh, right around that same time in 1972, uh, I think, was the first international Roma conference in London with participation from different countries. Uh, they made a Rome Council for the first time and they declared for the first time that the term is Roma or Romani for the collective grouping. And this is one reason why uh, the literature is so problematic and the culture is so problematic to apprehend, because it's really a collection of different families, uh, ethnic groupings, tribal groupings, or whatever you want to call them, that spread out over at least 16 different countries in Europe. Um, so let me mention a couple of the figures that were influential at the time that Bari Karoy came of age. Um, one woman who is really um, amazing is Maria Lamar. Uh, and Maria Lamar wrote a book called Steinzeit in, Germ in, in German. She's actually uh, Swiss, Swiss Yenish. Yenish is a grouping, a family grouping of Romani. Uh, but she wrote in German language. And she was in and out of mental institutions in. Uh, the 1940s, 50s, 60s, uh, had electroshock therapy and uh, tremendous abuses, uh, tried escaping several times, and she retreated into a kind of fragmented um, set of personas in her diary, and it was the only thing that was keeping her sane and together and uh, managing to navigate that experience. Uh, 
and it later emerged as this um, this book uh, in English, Stone Age, and um, it's an account of those times and her own um, reconstitution into a coherent personality through literature, and her her. Uh, it, it's it's available in German. It's languishing in English. It's not yet published. It's been sitting in a drawer for about 12 years uh, somewhere, which is so typical of so much Romani literature. It's simply not been commercially viable or anyway commercially attractive to English language publishers. Um, but her translator, uh, Roger Rusi, considers that language itself is under attack in this work. Um, and he likens it to an earthquake or an electrical storm. Uh, I, I don't speak German, but he calls it a, a journey from, and excuse me if I'm mangling the German, uh, from schreien, which is screaming, to schreiben, which is writing. And um, so, in a way, she is paralleling uh, the journey of the Roma during her generation. The, the, the Holocaust, as a, as a topic of Jewish studies and European studies generally, is uh, obviously um, well known. Uh, we have figures like uh, Elie Wiesel who have told their memoirs and who have made it uh, a seminal part of our um, basic cultural DNA in the West. But we don't associate the Holocaust, we, general, we, I, most pe many people, with the Roma. And they suffered as much or worse in terms of uh, uh, torture, abuse, uh, mass extermination, uh, experimentation, and so on. Uh, than, than uh, the Jews and other ethnic groups. Uh, so much so that in all Roma cultures, the Holocaust is referred to as the primus. It's the one single point of history that they can't escape from, the primus, the, the uh, essential urge of Romani culture. Um, so it's extraordinary that we don't have that as part of our symbol, um, but the Roma certainly do. And there's another writer, Tsea uh, uh, Stoika, She's Austrian, Austrian Lovari, uh, that's another uh, Roma family. And she was astonishingly a witness in no fewer than three concentration camps. She was in Auschwitz, she was in Ravensbrück, and she was in Bergen-Belsen. And she saw many of her family and colleagues and friends uh, exterminated in those camps and the torture and abuse that took place. And she wrote her memoirs in, uh, I think it came out in 1988, uh, I won't risk saying the title in German. It was published in German. The English translation uh, is We Live in Seclusion, The Memories of a Romney. And this and other works of hers has, have led her to be compared with Elie Wiesel. She's kind of the formative uh, figure of, of Holocaust consciousness for Romani culture. So these are staggering narratives. I mean, astonishing. Um, it's, it's with amazement that I started to myself discover some of this. And if we want to trace back the arc of Roma literature, back one generation, um, that's really where modern Romani literature begins, if you will, because unusually compared to some other cultures, um, it's been a largely oral tradition. And that's one reason as well why it's been so unknown for us. So if we want to trace back to the first, you know, literature, li literary activity of Romani's and, and how we understand it in terms of written literature, um, we might go back to Russia in the 1920s. And there began a uh, 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 Romani theater in, uh, actually in 1931, the Indo-Roman theater, in, uh, eventually in Romani language, originally in Russian. And um, Alexander Hermano is considered the sort of father of Romani literature in that sense. He, he like so many Romani, have a very, very complex uh, and difficult to trace history. So he was Moravian Romani by birth. He, that's his mother tongue. His mother was a Moravian Romani, but he scarcely heard that language. So he scarcely spoke it. Like most Romani, they adopt the language of the country that they're in. Um, so there's already a complex relation to, to language and mother tongue in that sense, which is unusual. Um, his father was Czech, so they spoke Czech at home, but um, he wrote in Russian because they moved to Russia early on in his childhood. So that was his mother tongue, if you will. That was the language he started writing in. 
But he became fascinated because of his, his mother's history with Romani languages. And so he started writing out the, he was the first person who started to codify the spelling for Romani, the, the grammar and the dialects of it. And he began this Romani theater in Russian and he wrote stories and, and so on. Um, and eventually switched to writing in Romani, but he was writing in Russian for most of his early career. So that's Alexander Hermano. Um, I'll give you a couple of other uh, names from those times. Um, the, probably the best known Romani writer in Europe has been Matteo Maximov. He was born in 1917. He lived right until the end of the 90s. He had a long and productive career. He wrote uh, 10 novels and he wrote uh, primarily in French at the beginning, so he was a French uh, Roma. And colorful history of, uh, of a lot of movement, a lot of fights. Um, in fact, his first novel in 1939 began as a, as a legal defense plea. So he was arrested with several other Roma um, because there was a huge uh, family feud between two Roma families in the town in France where he was. And he was imprisoned and his lawyer uh, recommended that he write out an account of what happened uh, in as much detail as possible <laughs> to handle his legal defense. And uh, that became his first uh, novel and uh, possibly the first uh, great Roma, Romani novel of the 20th, 20th century. Um, <laughs> wonderful, typical story. Um, he introduced, introduced, he uh, embodied and, and wrote out a lot of the themes uh, typical in Romani, already Romani oral culture. So there's a huge mythologizing that goes on. You know, you, you write uh, of the real world in larger than life terms. You aggrandize it uh, incessantly. Uh, you romanticize it. Um, also uh, tremendously open to supernatural themes, which is uh, common in Roma literature. Uh, it's not magic realism, it's just that it is, you know, I mean, it's just uh, in, intrinsic to the Romani uh, worldview. So um, he put a lot of that into his novels, um, but by the, uh, by the last part of his adult life, uh, by 1961, he was, and, and following for, for, for most of the second half of the 20th century, he was living a very quiet life as a Christian evangelical pastor in a small town in outside of Paris, a suburban town of Paris, with his four wives. And <laughs> so again, you know, a typical uh, Romani narrative. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention one more figure, uh, Ali Krasnitsi. Uh, he's from Kosovo. And he's significant because he's probably the first and most significant writer to actually write in Romani, um, to write novels in Romani. Um, these others, and, and others I'm too numerous to mention in Hungarian, Romanian, Belarusian, Russian, Czech, you name it, um, are mostly writing or largely writing in the languages that they, of the adopted country that they're in. And one reason for that is because the Romani language as a written form has historically been very uh, uh, vocabulary poor. It's not been a very rich language. So it, 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 traditionally in the literature in the 20th century, it tends to be lyric poetry and maybe theater as the two dominant forms. One reason for that is because the language itself is not so vocabulary rich. Um, but uh, um, Krasnitsi was not deterred by this, so he just started making up words and um, wrote uh, novels and wrote in Romani language. He uh, developed a Romani dictionary and uh, to date, he's still going, to date he's added about 25,000 words to the Romani vocabulary with his dictionary. Um, uh, taking words and putting them in different uh, tenses or forms, you know, creating new phrases and, and so on. Um, so that's exciting. And, um, but again, like so many Romani stories, it's, it, there's, there, there's never far from uh, danger and tragedy. He's a Kosovan Romanian, and when Yugoslavia broke up and there was the rise of nationalisms in the former Yugoslavia, um, <coughs> Albanian nationalists accused the Roma population of siding with the Serbs. And so they were again um, subject to systematic severe abuses and uh, disenfranchisement and worse. Um, and his whole family and tens or hundreds of thousands of others um, in 1999 lost all of their possessions, were hunted, imprisoned, uh, and so on, just for being Roma. 
the, on, it, it, the only thing that of his whole family, of all their possessions that they managed to preserve, was his manuscripts. So thankfully, we do have his body of work still um, today. But it gives some indication of how extremely different this narrative of Roma literature and Roma life and society is. They, the Roma have, are, are theoretically proto-Indo-European, um, come from the Far East some 600 years ago uh, to Europe. And because they have family groupings uh, which are not coterminous with national borders, um, they've kind of been carved up and uh, put into countries where they are almost, in, in some of them, systematically disenfranchised, uh, or worse, you know, um, even after the Holocaust. For example, in the, ni in the 1950s in, S in Switzerland, they were um, systematically sterilizing Roma women as being genetically inferior. Um, this is one of the things that uh, Maria Lamer, uh, the Swiss Yenish writer, writes movingly about. So um, they face a lot of obstacles and a lot of um, disenfranchisement that other groupings don't face. And if we come right up to the present day, in the last generation, in the last 20 years or so, there has been more of a, an attempt to systematize uh, Romani literature as a body of literature for the first time. I, I mentioned the, the Roma human rights movement that began in the 1970s and, and Kari, uh, Karoi Bari. And until maybe 20 years ago, that was the dominant narrative trying to bring Roma together. It was human rights. So these conferences that began and so on, they, they did have a nod toward culture, but mostly they were concerned, and, and vitally so, with Roma um, access to education, protection from um, violence, um, state services, uh, freedom from discrimination, um, education, and all of that. And the problem with that is the Roma themselves, um, culturally, that's not their cultural narrative. It's not intrinsic to Roma communities. I mean, if you, if you have human rights as an organizing principle for vastly disparate groups of people in different countries, in different languages, sometimes in different scripts, you know, uh, uh, across a, a continent, a human rights narrative, I if you look at it from a certain way, it's, it's the negative of what they are. It's the things they have in common, which are all the things that they don't have. You know, um, so it's, it's access, access to education, you know, uh, 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 sewage, uh, you know, electricity and, uh, you know, uh, discrimination, all those things. And that's not a basis for a culture. You know, that's not a basis for organizing a culture. So it didn't, it didn't take root very strongly in Roma culture. In, in Roma cultures, you know, across the continent, this human rights narrative. It's popular among the international, uh, cosmopolitan, academic, politically correct, uh, multicultural crowd, but that's not well represented in Roma communities. And so um, now, if I wanted to characterize where <coughs> academic scholarship has turned since then, in the last 20 years or so, there's an attempt to look at Romani culture in a more in the positive form, you know, what it actually is instead of what they're lacking. And um, I guess there's two strands that academia is taking with that nowadays. One is the cultural studies um, viewpoint. And if you look at it from a cultural studies viewpoint, you have issues of language and identity. You have issues of um, political language of Roma groups. You have um, the persistence of the oral tradition into the written and vice versa. How is the fact that it's now a becoming a written tradition affecting back into the oral tradition of the Roma and issues like that. So that's one strand of Roma studies nowadays. The other strand is this purely literary or aesthetic uh, strand. And um, that's dear to me uh, with Traffic of Europe and I'll mention that in a second. And that's more looking at um, are there any commonalities in narrative uh, among these different Roma groups? Is, is there anything common to their um, meta use of metaphor, uh, to their other poetic forms, uh, and so on? Is there some ur uh, culture that is common to these many different Romani groups? Um, 
and the barriers are immense. There's barriers of language, as I mentioned. There's barriers of country. So Roma do strongly identify with the countries that they're in. Um, Hungary and Roma very strongly identify as Hungarians. Um, although the problem is Hungarians don't identify Hungarian Roma as Hungarians. And so Roma in Hungary don't have Roma culture historically um, because they're trying to be Hungarian, which they are. And Hungarians don't have Roma culture uh, because they're systematically seeing them as other. And so they're not uh, favored in the national narrative either. And you see that being played out systematically, in especially in the Eastern European countries. Um, there's barriers of um, tribal and ethnic associations. So these are families that um, uh, don't traditionally get along very well. They themselves don't see themselves as one large ethnic population in Europe, you know, um, and that's th that's a uh, an obstacle to um, getting greater recognition. But taken all together, the Roma are the the Romani peoples, together the Enish, the Lovari, the Roma, and so on, is the greatest um, minority in Europe. They're the single biggest, most populous, populous minority on the European continent. Looked at from that perspective, how can they not have a seat at the table of the family of European cultures? It's absurd. <coughs> um, so this is the disconnect between the reality and the historical um, separation and um, uh, codification that has led to why we don't see and know uh, Romani literature generally. It's not because it isn't there, it's not because it isn't amazing, it's not because it isn't um, quite prolific, um, but it is for these very specific uh, and unusual, for an ethnic grouping, unusual historical circumstances. I have a literary foundation called Traffica Europe, and we are keen on taking a fresh page approach at the European level and bringing down the barriers of nation and national narratives, um, valuing all of those writers as well uh, who are in uh, dominant national narratives, absolutely. Uh, I'm a lover of the rose in whatever vessel it's in, you know, uh, what, whatever, uh, whatever water it's in. Um, but there's such an amazing panoply of other Europe, exotic Europe, um, stuff going on that doesn't fit any more neatly into the national narratives, especially since the fall of the Iron Curtain. Um, there's a dizzying panoply of migrations and movements and cross marriages of um, ethnic groups which have been caught uh, in uh, cross-border um, uh, geographical situations where their narratives are just now coming more to light and their, pers their particular histories. Um, the EU uh, I in general is starting to emphasize regional and ethnic differences more strongly as a counter to nationalisms and as an attempt to uh, maybe disenfranchise that old uh, hold on the narratives in order to create a more pan-European notion. And Traffic of Europe is exploring that territory. We are absolutely in no way um, politicizing the narrative. We're just looking for great quality literature, but we're looking everywhere. We're looking on the continent of Europe and not in the EU. And we're looking in a lot of these wonderful communities that uh, either aren't writing in the dominant language or haven't been part of the dominant narrative. And it's amazing. There are 225 living, present, native languages in Europe. Um, uh, we're talking about a continent of 47, 48 countries, uh, three quarters of a billion people. And uh, we in academia know very little of that, in part, for better or worse, because we have mirrored some of those same strictures in our departments. It's very useful to a point as a paradigm to have a German studies, to have a Slavic studies, to have a Russian studies, and so on. Um, but the actual living culture is much more variegated and much more interactive than that. So it's exciting also, I in parallel with that, in cooperation with that, to have a fresh page approach at the European level. And that's what Traffica Europe is doing. We have a literary quarterly online. Our first event was a pre-launch event in Conway Hall in London on Romani literature. And we chose that as our first focus exactly because this narrative is so suitable to take a fresh page approach on the European level.
So we had an event in Conway Hall, an, an evening gala. It was a charity event to support the European Roma Rights Foundation, which is the largest human right, Roma human rights foundation in the world. So they were on stage together with us. Um, it was chaired by the BBC TV um, correspondent for Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Nick Thorpe. And um, we uh, looked at Karoy Bari, we looked at Maria Lemaire uh, and others very much in a standard literary uh, 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 event kind of way. And in that context, we had people who were there for the sake of literature. And I, I think we're satisfied um, and intellectually um, uh, engaged and excited by what we were presenting. And in that context, people are much more open. They are much more empathetic because their genuine intellectual craving is satisfied they are fully present. And so in that context, we were able to talk about some of the more difficult <coughs> sociological or sociopolitical aspects of Romani life in Europe. And the European Roma Rights Foundation was there with us on stage, their director and so on, um, to talk about those things. But it was reversing the usual format of a charity event because it was a literary event. And um, that seems to be a good way forward to break down traditional resist resistances and barriers and stereotypes and approach more of an open and uh, collaborative and mutually attractive um, uh, uh, um, literary conversation in Europe. So this is what we're, in whatever modest way, hoping to contribute to. And um, one component which is uh, most exciting in Traffica Europe is we're now planning Traffica Europe Radio, which is to be Europe's literary radio station online. And uh, we're going to have partner-produced content from across the European continent hopefully um, groups of people in these cultures who want to present their cultures how they really are and how they experience them and how they want others to see them, not in terms of commercial uh, enterprise. I mean, we do want to sell books. We do want to help promote these cultures, absolutely. Um, but mostly as a cultural interest change in a very community spirit kind of way to give a new piece of infrastructure to European literature to help it to keep continue to stay open and growing and now on the European level to notice each other, to um, uh, hopefully uh, support each other and um, have some greater regard uh, on a continental level. Thanks, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm going to take the privilege, <laughs> to exercise my privilege, of asking you if you could just reflect a, a bit further on something that you mentioned that was really interesting to me, which had to do with, let's say, the the methodological issues of trying to construct a Romani literary history, uh, which seems to be ref reflective of two pressures, right? one being, as you've dramatized, being, let's say, history, <laughs> historical violence and erasure, um, on one hand. On the other hand, the, the oral tradition itself. You mentioned the kind of typical types of situations, right? Um, Living on, living on the margins of Paris with, you know, as a uh, minister, uh, a Christian minister with four wives. I mean, and that's reflective of sort of simultaneously historical conditions and a literature uh, type of storytelling. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, you mentioned at the same time this idea of looking for, let's say, structures or uh, ur texts that were, you know, ha had material in common. And I'm wondering if you could. Um, say a bit more about those pressures and how one might seek to, um, you know, manipulate all three of them or work between them. It's a very broad question, but I'd love to hear more. As a general rule, um, with notable exceptions, Europe has not been particularly traumatized in this generation. And so the amazing thing about humanity is that it does continually have this ability to regenerate. And um, the current generation of young Roma writers are simply um, by osmosis solving that um, problem of integration and, and, and trauma uh, reconciliation just by being in a more well-adjusted uh, phase of European life right now. Um, they're just writing a whole range of things. They're not obsessed with these issues anymore. 
Um, they're just writing happy normal text just like uh, any other Europeans, you know, in, in great regard. So the short answer is it just takes time to, um, to move forward, and that's often the, the, the real palliative and, and uh, most um, ennobling um, aspect of such narratives. Um, the language has the, 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 the language barriers have been the biggest um, uh, barrier to getting a more integrative um, um, holistic or healing uh, narrative for these things because these Roma are writing traditionally in uh, many different languages and literatures. That's why a comparative literature approach is so extremely useful in this regard because um, we in uh, our approach are developing tools and understandings for um, leapfrogging or um, circumventing those traditional cultural barriers. But it has kept the Roma divided from each other as well. So having a shared common language um, which is emerging as English in this generation is, is also a help to putting that story together. I don't know if I'm directly answering your question, but um, this is why, for example, at Traffica Europe, we're taking the approach of working in English language. It's, it's, an, it's an unprecedented opportunity, um, not as a kind of new neo-cultural imperialism, I hope, but uh, in recognition of the fact that for the very first time now in Europe, and I mean across the European continent, and I mean now, right now, in these past few years, for the first time ever, there is a single common auxiliary language that a majority of people from a majority of these countries speak and share, and that's English. And that's never happened before. Even in, in the Middle Ages under Christianity there was Latin, but it wasn't a spoken, you know, it wasn't the common language of common people. Um, if you, even if you go all the way, uh, and we're looking at Council of Europe, that's the 47 countries on the European continent, all the way to Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, um, um, and so on. If you look at a country like Georgia, it's now 90% um, fluent in English speakers. That's a staggering, you know. So that's a great opportunity to be able to continue the conversation forward by using the common shared medium of English language. And that's why Traffic at Europe Radio is perceived, it's an opportunity that didn't exist before, to have a shared and understand and, and work in, in English translation. Yes? Well, I have a question about the Roma language. I mean, how many of the Roma actually know the language? Is that a small minority or is it the majority? And are there efforts actually, I mean, you mentioned English as the lingua franca. Doesn't that in a way then endanger, you know, the, the Roma language? Or are there efforts to preserve or maybe make the Roma more prominent, language more prominent as a lingua franca among Romani? The Roma are happy to learn English because they're happy for the greater um, um, uh, platform and representation and ability to talk together. And um, the short answer is I, I, I don't know and don't want to misspeak um, to what are the percentages and what's the direction, but there's a resurgence of ethnic languages across the European continent which is actually encouraged uh, governmentally uh, in this phase. So it's a lucky happenstance. Um, and you see it not just with the Roma, you see it repeated all over, um, at least in the Western countries, um, uh, S -S Scots and Scottish Gaelic and Irish Gaelic and um, Basque and Catalan and, uh, you know, uh, Ossetian and all of these, uh, you know, little regional languages are again gaining favor <coughs> because there's a trend toward regionalism in the EU as a way of um, mitigating uh, the traditional national uh, narratives and, and therefore trying to get a leverage in to create a more pan-European sense. So it's a paradoxically um, a, a regional emphasis um, serves the continental narrative at the moment. Yes, uh, here. Thank you. Um, so I wonder if you could speak a little bit, I mean this is a sort of follow-up question, to the ways in which the English that is getting deployed in Europe relates to this to this sort of regional to this exploding of regional languages in Europe, which is to say like is this a kind of standardized American English? Is this the English we would think of as a more simplified sort of world English? Like what are what are the nuances of or the non-nuances I guess of the English piece of this whole comedy <coughs> puzzle in Europe? Yeah, so just to clarify, those are two separate phenomena, the emergence of regional uh, dialects and languages, re-emergence or re-strengthening, 
and the uh, widespread uh, appearance of English. And those are, those are two parallel things happening. Um, the, the regional aspect of it in some regions is really dominant over the, the question of English. Um, for example, in, uh, in, in, um, in the, uh, um, I don't know what you call them, the northern islands of Europe, you know, Denmark, uh, um, Faroe Islands, uh, uh, Finland, uh, Norway, uh, Greenland, you know, that, that swath of things. Um, there's uh, Ice Iceland. There, there is uh, a sense of um, developing a regional culture uh, explicitly. So it's not only in language, but even explicitly in terms of uh, um, finding um, affinities and um, having uh, associations dedicated to that region and so on to promote cultural affinities. Um, it's encouraged on that level. And that's an example of a phenomenon that has nothing to do with English language, quite the opposite. But there's in parallel a a natural evolution and recognition of the fact that um, there needs to be some um, shared auxiliary means of developing uh, or continuing to develop a shared identity among Europeans. Right now, the European Union as a government body spends one third of its entire budget on translations. It is continually translating every single <coughs> word and scrap of paper into the 24 four or 26 official languages of Europe all the time uh, for everyone. Um, and that's the official, you know, so that every person can have the official version of every European Union dictum of which there are a gazillion, um, you know, in their own official language. Um, so it's, it's actually um, bureaucratically a, a huge encumbrance for Europe to be operating in this way. And I'd add to that um, a, a picture that I have that in this generation, there has been tremendous vision in the political development of Europe, uh, the, the political pillar with the EU. There's been tremendous vision, rightly or wrongly, like it or not, um, in the economic pillar in Europe with the uh, Euro Eurozone. But I, I don't perceive that there's been a corresponding vision in developing forward the cultural pillar in Europe. There's been an awful lot of money thrown at it. You know, the European Union has been very generous in supporting culture, um, but without a corresponding vision. And I, 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 I suggest that many of the backlashes and nationalisms and, and problems and conflicts that we're seeing in individual European countries now are symptoms of that larger imbalance. And that if we want the European experiment to continue smoothly into the future in a growing and open way, um, we need to address that imbalance. And so to have a shared common auxiliary language, um, I think goes a long way in a more visionary way to giving a new narrative for Europe to continue to grow in open and mutual regard. Yeah. Um, speaking subjectively, I, I do experience that um, British culture or British society does still harbor some um, lingering distaste for Roma stuff. And so it was exciting to come with a Roma literary event 
because, uh, again, just speaking subjectively for myself, um, as an intellectual and as a poet and as a, as a person um, impassioned about literature, um, I tend to feel dumbed down when I go to a traditional charity event, you know, being pandered to, being talked to, you know, I, here is the narrative, you know, yes, 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 it's important and here's my money, you know, and that's the formula for a charity event. Um, and so I'm not fully present, I'm not fully uh, um, open and alive and using all of my faculties in that kind of a situation. Whereas in a literary event I am, I, I find um, that I am most engaged as a full human being um, in the ways that are most um, exciting and important for me. And so in that context, when I'm fully present and fully alive, um, suddenly those other things that I have very little tolerance for, and it's the it's fault, it's my fault, you know, um, suddenly, uh, you know, when you hear an amazing voice of, uh, of a Roma woman who's, who was institutionalized for decades and who managed to write through fragments of voices this incredible scream of anguish and integrate, you know, through literature, suddenly you want to know, well, how can that be? Where does that come from? What's the context? You know, what's the sociological context? What do the Swiss think of this? What's going on? What is the status of Roma? What's the living conditions? You know, what, what's the history? So you are very much al uh, engaged and alive because your literary soul is, um, is activated in that conversation, you know. It, it becomes not an other, and, uh, and uh, you're, there's no more a wall between you and the, this socio-political topic, you know. Um, you are actively seeking out that information because you are fully um, engaged with it. And so I believe that that mirrors a process which is very useful to give back to infrastructure in terms of the, the, the in this case, the European Union, or sorry, the European continent, let's say. Um, what I mean is we have ceded a lot of the public space to a sort of um, um, less than intellectually engaged or literarily engaged uh, conversation. If you look back to the, 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 the common, you know, uh, sense of the, the conversation in the 50s, you know, you think about the European coffee houses and you think about Sartre and uh, Camus and all these people sitting around and having intellectual conversations. Um, we've developed a virtual infrastructure with the internet, which is our shared commons now internationally. So we have the technological infrastructure to now have that at a higher level of abstraction than the coffee house, but we don't have the coffee houses, you know. Um, Traffic of Europe is an attempt maybe to, Traffic Europe Radio especially, to be that coffee house now, an abstract space because the technology has come of age. Um, certainly our awareness of each other in Europe has come of age, you know, the borders are down. Um, hopefully they will stay that way. And now let's make something of it and let's make something new, you know, um, and continue forward and create a, a little space where that conversation can continue to flourish. Yes, sir. Um, I don't think Britain is the only place that has told the Roma. Ten or more uh, years ago in Moscow, near one of the major railroad stations, there was, I saw for a number of years, a Roma settlement might not be the word. It was uh, 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 some kind of housing could be for an extended family or something like that. One year I went back and it was burnt out. Uh, not just abandoned, but I could see it was burnt out. In, in I mean, Russia or in? In Moscow. Yes. On the other, the other side, twice uh, in the streets of Moscow, I've been near them, almost a month, by Roma children and women. You, you don't see the men. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in a certain sense, the hostility of, of Russians, uh, it, I, I see a, a basis for that. But I, I have a question also. If you gave a figure, I missed it, an <coughs> estimate of the total number of Roma in Europe. Uh, I, unfortunately, I don't know the numbers. Uh, the, the notion of what is a Roma is also a little different in Britain, I should add. In the UK, there's this larger category of Roma gypsy and travelers. And there's a lot of native Brits who just like to live in caravans, you know, and uh, don't want to get jobs. And they're, you know, they're travelers. They're not necessarily ethnically Roma at all. So they have, therefore, their own window into this, which is not really based on this authentic a aspect of Roma culture, Roma literature, and, and, and so on. And that, that also complicates the, uh, the, the understanding of it. I'd also like to suggest that we be uh, a little bit I, I find it a little bit problematic to raise the idea that a certain kind of hostility to an ethnic group is legitimated, George. That, that's a bit uh, um, 
<laughs> curious in the statement. But anyway, take other questions. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk, and I um, congratulations on the efforts of Traffica. Um, I am from Istanbul originally, and um, and part of my work is about you know minorities of Turkey, um, but mostly about the Kurds and all of the problems are not very different, but Roma are much more invisible even in that, you know, minoritarian plane. Right. Um, and exoticized at the same time. You know, you think of people selling flowers and if you go to, you know, Istanbul, if you have dinner, the musicians will all be Roma and they make this brilliant music. But that's limited to that, you know, like that's that, that's it doesn't seep into the other parts of uh, society. I very much appreciated your previous comment about uh, the UK because I used to work as a producer for BBC World Service, and you know part of the mission is to reach communities of the world through different languages. There was no Kurdish station, there was no Romani station. It was still established languages, which kind of brings me to my question. You talked about how people, Roma people, and you know similar minorities are systematized through this like systemic um, I don't want to say ignoring disenfranchisement disenfranchisement uh, um, you know sort of like not having sort of uh, a legal ID and official ID because of the uh, issues connected to language you know like how the human rights movement was also connected to the Literature movement, this you know Western, very logocentric, very writing-oriented philosophy, where um, you know if that doesn't exist, you don't exist as uh, a, a citizen of Europe, almost. At the same time, and, and I, I completely agree with that, and I think it's a huge problem. I mean, even with larger um, minorities, like you know, there's no Kurdish literature out in the world. You know, but at the same time, this initiative is um, trying to achieve its efforts still through, uh, like that, you know, that hierarchy of language. We're still talking about, you know, achieving something through the language rather than other forms of narrative. And um, and I wonder, and I'm sure you're aware of this sort of. Um, irony in that, because I, I mean, I'm sure the Roma in Turkey, for instance, don't speak English, and they probably won't be able to be part of that community. And uh, I guess, you know, there's also this moment of recognizing, you mentioned that to the uh, oral traditions and like intangible heritage, oral histories, and I was kind of, kind of wondering if the project has also um, is, is open to these these sorts of thoughts, like how do we preserve the oral tradition or the formative tradition because you can't include more. You, you raise several good points. You raise several good points. These are good questions. Um, Traffica Europe Radio is um, hoping to uh, look at elements, some elements of literature which are traditionally not available to us on the printed page. So that's one exciting aspect of it, is that it's, it, radio is an oral medium, uh, oral, A-U-R-A-L, oral medium. And so we can look at oral, O-R-A-L, literature. Um, uh, and Romani culture is one that would benefit greatly from that kind of approach. Uh, we also can look at music, literary music. And Roma gypsy uh, folk music is vast and and um, fascinating and amazing and 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 quite variegated across the different cultures, you know. Um, so that's an example where this approach can bring new other aspects of cultures into relief, um, almost like starting to look at what's underneath the tip of the iceberg, you know, with cultures and when you start to look at oral tradition. So that is one exciting aspect we hope to look at. At the same time, we are very present oriented. So we don't have, uh, uh, as part of our mission now, to develop uh, a large archival o audio library, uh, except going forward from here, which is to say that we very much want to represent or um, um, take as our, our stewardship uh, the current living uh, culture of Europe. 
how can people feel they are, what's going on now? Literature as news, you know, um, so that people can realize that this is not a historical um, endeavor, that we're not um, archivists, you know, in a museum looking at uh, Roma culture from 100 years ago. No, these guys are writing and living and speaking and publishing today. And that's very much something we want to give to the project, a very present oriented contemporary uh, feel. But we are partnering with other people who have done tremendous things with audio archives. Um, for example, one partner is World Literature Today, and they're opening their entire audio archive to us to cherry pick at will um, going forward. So to use any segments uh, between our shows or in our shows uh, um, from their vast and amazing archive of people across Europe and elsewhere reading their own poetry and other things in their native languages. So we will be having some, uh, some of that as well, thanks to our partners. We, want to, we don't want to recreate or compete with uh, some of many wonderful initiatives that are out there. We want to honor them, we want to connect them, we want to celebrate them, and in a shared way we want to create this shared platform uh, as a win-win for everyone who's involved with literary translation and European culture going forward from here. So we very much hope people will catch this community spirit of what we're doing, and in that way, um, um, be able to give greater access and, and awareness to those archives that do exist. Um, by the way, um, because of your uh, field, I, I'll just mention, and I'm happy to throw this out just as a general mention, um, with Professor Thomas Beebe, uh, we will be hosting a seminar at Harvard's ACLA conference in March uh, on exotic Europe. And uh, we are allowed to have at least half the, or up to half the papers in that seminar coming from Penn State because we're in Penn State. So anyone here who wants to get a paper proposal in at the ACLA website, um, the seminar is named Exotic Europe. And um, you have until Wednesday midnight, Pacific Standard Time. And I have no idea what that means. I don't know. I've been doing this for decades. I don't know if Wednesday midnight means Wednesday midnight, which is 12 a.m legally, which is, means Tuesday, the end of Tuesday, or if it means Wednesday at the end of Wednesday, midnight, which is actually Thursday technically. I still don't know what people mean, so you may only have till Tuesday, possibly. Also Pacific Standard Time, does midnight come earlier or later? I can't remember. Later. later. Oh, that gives a little bit of extra time. <laughs> so you have until 3 a.m. Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, probably Thursday, um, to get a paper proposal in for that. And uh, I very much hope that uh, this is the kind of conversation we want to have, not only about Roma, but about Kurds, about uh, Scottish, Scots, about uh, Catalan, about Ossetians, you know. Um, and, and let's have that conversation, you know, and, and create a greater, um, mean for it, a greater um, awareness of, of all of these issues, because there are parallels in all of these cultures. People are structurally going through this similar um, coming of age to be more um, present and more connected and more um, recognized in what they are. Thank you all very much for our time. Please join me in thanking you. Thank you so very much to Jonathan, to the department, to the organizers, and to this school. It's a privilege to be here and to be setting up this project here, and I hope to talk with some of you more in future.